Welcome to How You Live It, a transformative podcast featuring best selling author, inspirational speaker, and minister, Dr. Rick Rigsby. And now, Dr. Rick. Hello, friends. Thanks so much for joining us. I want to discuss doing the hard things in life. You see, most people gravitate toward the easy, choosing the path of least resistance. I think we can all agree that greatness is never achieved that way. We tend to avoid doing the hard stuff these days. If there's an easier way, we'll find it. If there's a shortcut, we'll take it. If it doesn't cost us that much time, we'll go for it. I've been thinking about this topic a lot over the last few months. It all began when I was about to speak at a global conference for a cruise line. Among the presentations from the vice presidents who spoke before me, there was one that really stood out. The executive in the midst of her presentation said, quote, we must learn to do hard better. I was so motivated that I began to rewrite my speech at that precise moment around that very theme. In fact, I've been working this theme into several speeches since. We must do hard better. What a profound statement and what a timely statement considering our high tech culture, which encourages shortcuts, quick fixes and easy remedies. Recently, I listened to a fascinating TED talk by Dr. Tim Elmore, best-selling author and CEO of Growing Leaders, an organization created to develop merging leaders. Elmore offered an insightful presentation about the inverse relationship between technology and emotional intelligence. Here's his thesis. Technology isn't going away. Rather, we must learn to balance it with humanity. During his talk, Elmore shared his emotional intelligence diagram that he titled, Our Scene Today. He used the word scene as an acronym that includes five words describing our relationship with technology and the consequences we can assume. The acronym scene represents the words speed, convenience, entertainment, nurture, and entitlement, words that reflect our 21st century world. As you listen to Elmore's argument, Think the way a young person might interpret this. I couldn't help but think about how our world today, with all its technology, looks to my four grandchildren. Let me explain. The first word is speed. You know what? Elmore says we don't call it gram, we call it Instagram, because everything is fast today. So young people may not look favorably at things that take a lot of time. Speed might give the impression to this younger generation that slow is bad. How about convenience? Just click a button. Might offer the impression that hard is bad. Or entertainment in our hands 24 hours a day might suggest that boring is bad. Or nurture. Elmore says we live in a safety-obsessed world, and the message is don't take risks. Risk is bad. And entitlement. What about my perks? I shouldn't have to work for this, should I? might give the message that labor is bad. I want to break down just a couple of these. First of all, entertainment. That suggests that boring is bad. We're all entertained around the clock. Whether we're standing in the line at the grocery store or standing on the street corner, we're entertained all day and all night. We don't seem to take a break from our phones. But guess what? Neuroscientists say this is not good, that our brains actually need a break. We need a break to recharge. I knew that, but I didn't know this. We actually need boredom, according to scientists. We need boredom and quiet because they create space to develop empathy and creativity. I will tell you this, when it comes to risk-taking, you remember nurture. In a safety-obsessed world, the message is risk is bad. I will say as a former prof, risk-taking ought be a required college class. Our country was built on risk-taking. Yet, as Elmore points out, the balance of power has shifted from taking calculated risks to a hyper-emphasis on safety. His argument? Our relationship with technology actually works to impede the development of leaders. How about speed, with the inverse relationship being 
slow is bad. Let me give you this counter argument. It can be found in the work of Anders Ericsson and his research in the field of extraordinary performance. Listen to this. Genius level performance, according to Erickson, is achieved through supervised, very specific, deliberate practice over a long period of time. Here's his conclusion. Erickson says that his research indicates it takes a minimum of 10 years of purposeful, deliberate, disciplined focus before you see the first signs of genius. Wow. Slow. Hard. Boring. Taking risks. Working. Labor. Are all the very elements that grow us into good people, good adults, productive citizens. Here's Elmore's conclusion. Quote, our 21st century technology is unwittingly stealing the very components that will naturally build life skills. We must be more intentional about rebuilding the social, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual muscles we need, end quote. As we focus on the inverse relationship of convenience, that is, pushing a button is easy, so hard must be bad, I want us to focus on this one thought. How can I do hard better starting this very moment? Listen to this. To no one's surprise, Elmore says that among the K-12 through teachers that his organization works with, the most common phrase they hear among students is, this is too hard. The unpopular teachers who made work hard during high school, remember those? They were labeled unpopular teachers. They just seemed to make it rough for no apparent reason. I find it interesting how I value those very teachers this very day. I'm so glad, for example, in graduate school, that I had a professor who challenged me to do hard better. He was my statistics prop. Now, I didn't want to be in multivariate regression analysis to begin with, but it was required, right? And he refused to allow us to use software to solve problems. I remember thinking that the software known as statistical analysis software, or SAS for short, would save a ton of time. It would help us get through the problem solving. We wouldn't have to deal with pencil and paper and eraser and hours and hours and hours of work and thinking through the problem. Uh-oh. What I couldn't understand then, I appreciate now. The professor wanted us to think, to actually use our brains and not a machine. During his class, I was forced to work a problem rather than manipulate buttons. Imagine removing life skills such as slow and hard and quiet and taking risks and working hard from our development. I want you to think about it this way. Think about your greatest accomplishment right now. What's been your greatest accomplishment thus far in your life? And then know this, that accomplishment likely would not have occurred because nothing meaningful occurs in life without these life skills. On September the 12th, 1962, at Rice University in Houston, Texas, President John Kennedy gave a speech to bolster public support of his initiative to go to the moon by 1970. Kennedy said emphatically, quote, we choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and to do other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard, end quote. Friends, it's time to reframe our thinking. We must not avoid hard. We must do hard better. Kennedy, if you recall, was the symbol of the promise and the hope of a new generation. And our country took its cue from its leader. I can remember back in 1962, I was a first grader. America, despite her problems, despite her issues, was neither cynical nor skeptical. As a first grader in 1962, we were taught to believe first by our parents and then by our teachers, that we could do anything, that we could be anything, that we represented the generation of great change, of promises that could be realized. It's very different in America today. It's a different feeling. While we have issues that divide and violence that's out of control, there's a thick oppression that blankets the air, covering us with a sense of helplessness and hopelessness. 
but I still have hope and I invite you to have hope. Consider this, Kennedy's speech reminds us of our great potential. After Kennedy's famous line that we go to the moon not because it's easy, but because it's hard, he says, quote, because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, end quote. A goal that's hard will measure the best of our energies. A goal that's hard will bring the very best out of us. A goal that is hard is one that we're willing to accept, one we're unwilling to postpone. You see, friends, there's something inside of us. There's something within our DNA that responds to a challenge. We know that ultimately, such a response builds resilience capacity. We discover new skills, we get greater confidence, and there's a promotion of overall well-being within us. Responding to challenges makes us stronger. Great people accept challenges that force skill development and maximizes our energies. In other words, great people do things that other people don't. And we need to remind ourselves that greatness is inside of each of us, regardless of social problems and political bickering and even feelings of complacency. You know, we all wanna be Elton or Beyonce or the Stones, making millions while we entertain the masses. We all want a, a brain like Einstein's or a voice like Jennifer Hudson's or creativity like Steve Jobs or Elon Musk. We all want the courage of, of Churchill or the brilliance of a Merrill or a Denzel. We all wanna play basketball like Mike or golf like Jack or Tiger or play tennis like Billie Jean or Serena or Roger. But what we don't realize is that those are human beings that worked hard. Friends, listen, in every one of the people I just mentioned, the road to greatness was rough. The road to greatness was daunting, required risks, was slow going, was just plain hard. Instead, many people have this lottery mentality today. I'll just select these numbers and I'll be on easy street. Maybe today we should think about this one thought. I'm gonna choose not to bypass the greatness within me. Rather, I'm gonna invest in myself. First step, do hard better. So friends, my argument is simple. Challenge yourself to improve, then back that challenge up with an action step. Do hard better. I close with this simple story about a man that I knew who wanted to start a dry cleaning business in the 1950s, a time when it was very difficult for a black man to get funding. But this did not detour the man. He built his dry cleaning business by visiting the scrap heaps and the garbage bins of every cleaners in town. He also built a very successful business. His son, a best-selling author and one of my best friends, wrote about his father in a book, how his dad would put all of his focus on one stain at a time. The son said, quote, I can remember watching my father concentrating on that one stain and not leaving until that stain was completely gone. Daddy built his business by cleaning one stain at a time, end quote. The father eventually sold his profitable business to a major dry cleaning chain for a very handsome price. Making a commitment to do hard better will always pay dividends. When you do the hard stuff, friends, you'll be in rarefied air. Zig Ziglar said it best, there are no traffic jams on the extra mile. A few years ago, Ann Voskamp wrote a great little book titled The Broken Way, A Daring Path to the Abundant Life. In this book about embracing and celebrating the brokenness in each of us, the author offered this simple prayer. Be brave. Do not pray for the hard thing to go away, but pray for a bravery that's bigger than the hard thing. Friends, let's commit to doing hard better, to fully living to our potential. Let's do our part and don't be surprised if in the process, we don't change the world. Well, that's gonna do it for this episode. Until we meet again, this is Dr. Rick asking the most important question I can ask. 
how you live it. Are you ready to make an impact in your world right now? Do you want to stop existing and start living your best life right now? Dr. Rick wants to give you the first chapter of his best-selling book, Lessons from a Third Grade Dropout, absolutely free. Just go to www.rickrigsby.com forward slash free gift to get the print or audio book right now. This is the podcastfactory.com.